Have you ever want to know a particular person better? To be able to predict his or her every move and reaction. Be familiar with all of his or her tastes and see right through his or her personality so you can be the wiser. If so, then you may embark on a journey. There you will find your answers or so the forgotten runes of the Aztecs dictate. Needless to say, it'll be dangerous and the burden of risk very heavy. Your intentions may be as innocent as trying to comprehend the person you love or give a heartwarming surprise to a friend or family member. Or it may be sinister as to use the information you are given to manipulate and thwart someone you loathe. It may even be wanting to know a very influential person so you may cajole and appease that person with ease. Regardless, I will not judge your intentions, but beware, because you will be evaluated, and the basis of that analysis is not only obscure, but seemingly random. So don't think you are sure to get out of this unscathed, just because you want to know your lover's dream honeymoon getaway to impress him or her. This is the price of knowledge that will be bestowed upon you. You will need some hair from the head of that person of interest. Even a single strand will do, and you're good to go. Tucked away in the dense foliage, there is a sacred yet forbidden retreat somewhere along the banks of the Amazon. It lurks in one of the nooks and crannies of the marshy vegetation, its whereabouts ever changing. Mortals are only tolerated on the full moon night. The place can never be located otherwise. Start looking, riding a boat, preferably one that makes minimal noise, as the moon makes its first appearance. Reaching the entrance before midnight is a prerequisite. You are listening for a distant hiss, one not so dissimilar from a snake's or one audible when you twist open the stopper of a carbonated beverage. It is said to be a calling to you, more like a challenge, in their indecipherable tongue, as if they are saying, So, do you think you are worthy? If you are able to hear a hiss, stop the boat, try to locate it. Once you have a rough geographical estimate, anchor your boat along the bank and start foraging. You must leave anyone you brought with you on the boat, otherwise the place will not show up. Look for a cave, it should be just enough specifically for someone of your height to enter. You may use a light source to eliminate your path as you search, but the eerie yet glaring moonlight should suffice. As soon as you spot the cave, extinguish your light source. Leave all technology behind, otherwise they will be incapacitated. Bear nothing with you other than your clothing and the hair. Bear your feet. The moonlight should generate a lighting synonymous to the rustic images of early television, devoid of color, ominously monochromatic. Muster up your courage, you'll need every ounce of it, and walk inside. It will be pitch black at first so walk cautiously to make sure you don't get lost. Use the walls to navigate. Feel for a pattern of carved series of circles at the height of your hands. There will be diverted paths and forks. Feel for the pattern. I must stress that you do not fall any walls that do not have this pattern. Around five minutes in, you will hear footsteps behind and ahead of you. Don't panic, the noise from footsteps will vary, some light, others heavy, some will correspond to strolling, others pacing, and even running. Things will brush past you occasionally, and even bump into you, only to immediately dart away. Do not heed them, move forward, after a while you will see a light, as of one at the end of a tunnel. The walls bearing the circles should lead you right there. 
Shafts of moonlight will riddle the pathway, illuminating the circle pattern so you no longer have to feel. Proceed with a steady pace. No need to run, nor lag. The footsteps will cease. You might curse your peripheral vision, for shadows will linger at the corners of your eyes, only to fall back as you turn around. But you need not worry. Keep walking. Occasionally you will come across diverted pathways, and something will be standing there. A gray, indiscernible figure, mottled with inky stains of black. Unlike the others, it will not retreat from your plane of sight. On the contrary, it will gesture you to it. Run. You must run past all of these pathways. Otherwise, I'll get to that. That thing will scream and chase after you, but you must not stop, and you must not look back. You may stop when the footsteps die away. After what might seem like an hour or so, you will have reached your destination. An enormously spacious room. Enter the room, and you will see a stone altar illuminated by a single moonbeam descending from the ceiling. Patterns similar to the circles on the walls will have embellished its every surface. Everything else will be hiding under the cover of darkness. As you make your way up to the altar, you will be greeted with whispers and hisses from the darkness that surrounds you. There will be occasional shrieks and undulating moans. Something might screech as if right beside you or right behind you. Jump scares are always on the table. Anything to dry your attention. Whatever you do, do not look. Keep your eyes on the altar at all times. When you have reached the center, sit down with your legs crossed. The full moon will be visible through a slit on the roof as it pulls the altar with its ghastly yet mysterious light. Place the hairs at the center and take a deep breath. Close your eyes and pronounce in a low voice, as humbly as you can. Face keeper, bestow upon me your knowledge. The noises in the darkness will halt. Open your eyes and look at the hair. The hair will be set ablaze, but not by conventional fire. The tiny flames will emanate a soft, white, opalescent glow. Your body will note a steep temperature drop. There will be a presence around you, which you will find to be oddly reminiscent. Whose face do you desire to know by heart? The question will come from a random direction. Keep staring at the fire. The voice will be none other than your own, grim and solemn, and it will speak to you in the same language you used to summon it. Say the person's name. There will be a period of silence. Don't look up or make any kind of noise. Remain seated as you are. Why do you want to know that face by heart? Again, from a random location, in the same voice and language. State your intention as honestly as you can. It should be obvious that you mustn't lie. In the case that you do, remember that it will not only know of it, but also take into account of that lie when judging you. There will be a period of silence. I urge that you remain as you are. Are you worthy? The voice will suddenly reveal itself right behind you. Do not take your eyes off the flames. As adamantly as you can, say, Yes. Yeah. As soon as you do, the flames will flare for a split second and extinguish themselves. You will hear a multitude of malevolent hisses all around you. A grim, spiteful aura will burn in the air. You will be kept under the impression that an otherworldly presence is approaching you from far ahead. Stay as you are and keep staring at the ashes. At one point, all noise will reach an abrupt halt. A violent surge of wind will blow the ashes onto you, and you will black out. 
you will open your eyes to the cacophony of birds rising at dawn. You will be lying at the place where you spotted the cave, only that the cave will be no more. Rise, gather up your things and go back to the boat. Now you can naturally think exactly like your desired person, as if you can dress yourself in that person's very mental makeup. Of course, you can take it off just as easily. In the case that you were not worthy, be prepared to face nothing but sheer confusion and frustration for the rest of your life. The face keeper will have robbed you of who you are. You will know nothing. No memories, no language, nothing. Your mentality will be likened unto a newborn baby awed at the world around you, as if seeing it for the first time. Now, as for my warnings, what if you looked up during talking to the face keeper, or didn't follow the wall, or responded to the model figure's beckons? The outcome is the same, immortality. Sounds great, doesn't it? Yep, just like those shadowy figures or the modeled summoner trapped in that lair for all of eternity, rejected by death itself. They just want more friends, that's all. Now, if you make it out successful, there are no catches, no restrictions. You have been deemed worthy. You are free to proceed using your newfound prowess in any way you see fit. Feeling powerful, want more? You can if you want to. Just take some hair off another person and return it to the Amazon. Go through it again. You've done it once, right? No problem. But be warned. The face keeper doesn't take ambition too kindly. I suggest you stop to listen that your chances of being deemed worthy twice in a row is much slimmer. And what if you aren't? Will the face keeper snatch away your ability? Oh no, you can keep that. It'll take away you and only you. But hey, you've got someone else's personality, right? Sure you do. Good luck being that person when he or she legitimately exists. You know that you're you. So why is that person claiming to be you? Why is your mother calling him or her her child? Why is your lover sleeping with that person? He or she is the real deal. You are just a clone personality, stuffed into a now unknown body. Identity theft with an unexpected twist. Don't you think? Makes you wonder whether losing the first time around was better, huh? If this doesn't bother you though, go on. Sail along the Amazon in the moonlight. Seeking that hiss. I wish you good luck. But don't forget to ask yourself. Are you worthy? If you want to lose your grasp on reality. And destroy your complete sanity. Just listen to the clock. But this will not be easy. Let me tell you right now, this is not something to mess around with. It's just an easy way to lose your mind within the confines of your own home. But there are a couple guidelines to follow. First, pick a room with no windows. It can be a room for anything, but it just can't have windows. Second, you can start at any time in the day, even if you wish to start at night for the process will take exactly 24 hours to complete. Third, cancel all appointments you have for that day. Turn off your phone if you have to, for there can't be any distractions for you to focus on. Fourth, make sure it is a calm and quiet day outside and not windy or storming. Lastly, to start the process, you must go into the room you've picked. Put a clock inside. The clock must make a distinct tick-tock sound 
when every second passes. Turn off the lights and light a candle. That candle will be your only source of light. Once you have done all of that, I honestly want you to ask yourself one question. Do I really want to do this? If your answer is yes, then may God have mercy on you. I'm here to merely prepare you on what to expect. Alright, let me tell you a little bit of information about the procedure. Back in the mid-1800s, radical members of the Christian and Islamic faith used it as a way to connect with God. It was kept under wraps due to its extreme nature, an unusual method to connect with the supernatural. During the procedure, they would have been in constant prayer and worship, but would eventually stop due to the events that would happen afterwards. The clock represented life on earth, and how short it can be, and the candle represented God as the only way of guidance through life. More often than not, each person would go through the procedure, lose their minds, and within a day, would kill themselves from what they have claimed to see. But if you are one of the lucky ones, you can keep your sanity, like me. Okay, now here's what to expect. The first three hours are the least eventful, mainly because nothing really happens. But prepare yourself in these hours. These are the only hours in which you may choose to leave the procedure. In the fourth hour, you will not be able to escape by any means. The lock on your door will lock by itself and you will have no methods to move it. In the fifth hour, you will start to sweat profusely and will start to have feelings of anxiety. You will start to look behind you many times and every time there will be nothing there. In the sixth hour, you will hear noises. Not noises from the house or from outside, but fuds and thumps throughout the hour in 10 minute intervals, with each noise getting louder. In the 7th hour, you will pass out and dream. This will be the only pleasant hour throughout the process. You will dream about the best moments in your life, every great accomplishment, wonderful memory, and friends you have made will appear before you. It will have been the best dream you have ever had in your life. Even events from the future can appear. At the beginning of the eighth hour, you shall wake up. But when you do, you will feel an extreme sense of elation and comfort, similar to the effects of smoking marijuana. Now, for some this can be considered another pleasant hour due to the feeling of the drug, but what comes after will be the start of your suffering. In the ninth hour, you will, in a sense, go from one drug to another. Your feelings of happiness will change to that of extreme adrenaline and energy, similar to the effects of any stimulant. But a warning, you must try your hardest to keep yourself under control. You're unpredictable. There is no telling what you will do in this state. On the 10th hour, you've hopefully had minimal injuries from the last hour, but you will start to feel normal, and your feelings you've previously felt will subside. Now you will hear screaming, but the screaming can vary from what it sounds like, from a little girl to a firm grown man. You will hear screaming at six minute intervals throughout the hour. This hour is going to feel like an eternity to pass. At the eleventh hour, the light from the candle will go out. That's it. You're left alone in the darkness. You are free to think to yourself, most likely regretting the decision you have made. At the twelfth hour, the light from the candle will reappear. But do not worry. This is another hour of silence, but mentally prepare yourself 
what is about to happen next. On the thirteenth hour, you shall pass out much like you did during the seventh hour, but don't expect happy memories. In this dream, you shall experience every painful, heart-wrenching moment, suffering and unpleasant things in your life, even suffering in your future, including your own death. This will be the worst dream you have ever had in your life. At the 14th hour, you will wake up. This is another hour of silence, but the silence will be broken by your own sobbing. Your tears shall continue until the hour is over. On the 15th hour, putting it very bluntly, is when things start to get weird. You will talk to someone. He's not visible, but he's there. He doesn't have a name, but I'm giving him one. He is your guardian angel, but you can call him watcher or protector. But for me, I call him asshole. This may seem funny, but trust me, it suits him. The first thing he will say to you is, Ask me anything, and I shall give you an answer. You can ask him anything about your life, what will happen in the future, and why events occurred the way they did. He will give you an answer, but in extreme and graphic details, and give reasons for things you will not understand, whether it be a tragedy or a death. By the end of the hour, he will say farewell and leave. On the 16th hour, he will talk to your parents. But they do not make a physical appearance, mind you. Now it's your turn to answer questions. They will ask you questions about what you have done with your life. And if you do not answer one of their questions, they will press on for an answer until you can't take it anymore. At the end of the hour, they will go away. On the 17th hour, you will talk to the most important person in your life. He will ask you why and how you became friends, but keep in mind, he is not looking for friendly conversation. He is questioning your friendship with him, finding every mistake you have done to cripple your friendship. Reasoning with him will not work, and he will act like your parents did during the previous hour. On the 18th hour, you will speak to the most important girl in your life. She will do the same as the person in the 17th hour and ask the same questions. On the 19th hour, you will talk of yourself, meaning you will talk of your future self. And trust me, this is the least pleasant conversation. He will tell you things you will not want to hear about yourself and will ask you questions you can and cannot answer. Soon it'll be too much, and you will find yourself screaming at yourself. Anger and self-loving will be the only emotion you have. On the 20th hour, following the events of the 19th hour, you will find any possibility to hurt yourself. Self-inflicting pain will be constant in this hour. Some have even committed suicide. On the 21st hour, if you manage to survive the previous hour, here is what will await you. Music? Yes, music. It will be soft orchestral music with a choir singing Gregorian chant, similar to church music, but more beautiful. By the end of this hour, your wounds will heal. Don't ask me why. Even I don't know. On the 22nd hour, the music will stop. This is another hour of silence, but you will have time to think to yourself. The light on the candle will change colors, all colors of the spectrum. This is quite a sight to behold. It's almost soothing. On the 23rd hour, you will sing Gregorian chant, but your singing will be the only sound in the room. You honestly don't know what you're singing, but it sounds beautiful and you will actually want to sing more. Finally, the 24th hour. 
This is the most interesting hour. Rumor says you talk to God himself, but here's how it goes. You are pinned to the floor by some unknown force, and someone or something asks you a question at 10 minute intervals. Questions like, are you happy? Or would you like to change? You must answer. You will feel the need to. The questioner sounds like a man, but at the same time, an animal. Almost like the roar of a lion. His voice is terrifying, but yet comforting at the same time. After the hour is up, you will be able to get up from the floor, and the door will unlock. If you're lucky, you still will have your sanity. Now, it is up to you what you shall do with this information. If you want to do this, I'm not stopping you, but I'm giving you fair warning. Some things are beyond the realms of human comprehension, and some things we just have nothing to explain the unnatural. But whatever it is, at least we know we are not alone. Now remember what I have told you. If you want to lose your grip on reality and destroy your complete sanity, just listen to the clock. The cat and mouse game is a game for children where you ask for two volunteers to play the cat and the mouse. But it used to be an old pagan ritual used mainly to interact with evil spirits. While it was mainly used as a scare tactic to play with otherworldly demons and devils, there is still a very existent chance of death to those who play the cat and mouse game. There is an even higher chance of permanent mental scarring. It is highly recommended that you do not play the cat and mouse game. However, for those few thrill seekers searching for a rush, or for those delving into obscure occult rituals, these are simple instructions on how to play. Do so at your own risk. Instructions Prerequisites It must begin exactly at 1 a.m. when you begin performing the ritual. Otherwise, it will not work. Materials You will need a candle, two pieces of paper, a writing implement, matches or a lighter, at least one drop of you and your partner's own blood, and at least enough volunteers to form a circle. They will need their own of the aforementioned materials, and they will have to perform the steps below accordingly. Step 1. Draw a cat on one piece of paper and a mouse on the other. It doesn't have to be perfect, you just need to get it done and over with. Step 2. Write you and your partner's full names, first, middle, and last, on the pieces of paper. Place your name on the piece of paper under the drawing of either a cat or mouse, and your partner will do the same with the other. Put at least one drop of blood on the papers. Allow it to soak into the papers. Step 3. Turn off all of the lights in the place you are doing this. Now, take out the candle and light it. Place it next to the blue blood-soaked papers where it can be in the middle. Step 4. Have your friends form the circle. The hour must be 1 a.m. upon doing so. Then, blow out the candles, and if you are the mouse, you must enter the circle. But, if you are the cat, you must stay out of the circle at all times. Your friends have to hold hands and they begin repeating these words over 30 times above a whisper. Your friends 
friends have just allowed the Catman to enter your friend and hunt you down. Step 5. Survive without being caught. This is where the game begins. You must now run around outside or inside your house. Your goal is to avoid the Catman at all costs until 5 a.m. Should you feel like you are being watched, that means the Catman is near you. You must hide till he is gone. If you are not successful in doing this, you must immediately run back in a circle. If you are unsuccessful, the Catman will catch you, rip you apart, and eat your flesh and organs one by one. You will feel it, but you will be unable to react. If you are successful in running back in the circle of your closest friends, you must remain there until 5 a.m. If you are successful in hiding, you may proceed with the game. You must continue the game till 5 a.m. without being attacked by the cat man or being trapped inside the circle to win the cat and mouse game. The cat will leave your friend's body at 5 a.m. and you will be safe to proceed with your morning. Addition Indications that you are near the cat man will include hearing very soft whispering coming from an indiscernible source and seeing your partner through the darkness. If you experience any of these, it is advised that you leave the area to avoid the cat man. Do not turn on any of the lights during the cat and mouse game. Do not use a flashlight during the cat and mouse game. Do not go to sleep during the cat and mouse game. Do not attempt to use another person's blood on you and your partner's name. And definitely do not attempt to provoke the cat man in any way. Good luck. You're gonna need it. The following details the way to summon a paranormal entity known as the Foil Falcon. Many have used its services for centuries and have reaped the benefits of having such a strange connection to this bizarre oddity. Any person can summon this being, but they require a certain set of ingredients and a good understanding of the English language. The Balkan are small, peculiar creatures found within Scottish folklore. Accounts and tales of their exploits are tied to human interaction. While labeled mostly as mischievous spirits, they can be seen as valuable accomplices and allies by their human associates, willing to assist in particular tasks depending on how the creature is appeased. The Fwil Balkan is deemed to be one of the more dangerous entities within its species, but is seen to provide a fantastic reward if beckoned correctly. Firstly, you can take comfort in knowing that the location of where the ritual takes place is not an important factor. It can be summoned in any country with the respective time zone. You could do this in your own home or your dorm room, anywhere you feel like you call your own, just as long as you will not be interrupted during the night. The ritual needs to have taken place after sunset, any earlier, and the balcony will not manifest. Now you will need to gather some ingredients. Depending on where you live, these may be difficult to come by, but with the advent of the modern internet, it shouldn't be too difficult to bring them straight to you through online vendors. If you are going to source the materials from websites, the reader is advised to order the goods so that they are delivered to your chosen location at around the same time, as certain goods may spoil or end up lost after a short while. To start, you will need to find some sodium chloride, better known as table salt. 
which should be easy enough to find in a regular kitchen. About two teaspoons should be added to a small bowl, which should also be easily found. Hold on to this bowl as it will hold the ingredients needed for the summoning ritual. Secondly, you will need to acquire the ashes of burned oak wood. You don't have to go looking for a tree to cut down. Dismantling some old oak furniture and burning it will produce the needed component. Any other wood would not be sufficient. Once the flames have died down, take one handful of ash and place it into the bowl along with the salt. The next ingredient are the leaves of Artesmia vulgaris, better known as common mugwort. Mugwort was said to hold mystic properties by the indigenous Celts populating the British Isles. But Scottish enchanters originally preferred to use the subspecies of Norwegian mugwort, Artesmia Norvegica, subspecies Scotica, which is native to Scotland. It became the preferred ingredient for the ritual, but readers are advised not to go searching for this particular plant, as it is now labeled as an endangered species. Common mugwort will perform in the same manner as its Norwegian cousin, albeit with comparably stunted results. If you are inclined to follow in the ways of cleanliness, you may want to get any notions of summoning the Fwil Bolkin out of your mind, as menstrual blood is the next component. How you acquire it is entirely your own business, but a few drops will be enough to give the mixture its magical properties, meaning that squeezing a freshly used tampon is a viable method. Any other blood will not be sufficient. The final step of this list is far less vulgar than the previous entry. Mead. This is an alcoholic beverage made with honey and was regarded as a sacred drink among the Celts, said to hold magical properties. It has become something of a niche market in recent years, but there are breweries dedicated to producing mead, though these may be difficult to come by depending on where you live. While there are several types of mead and various ways of brewing it, the Bulkin does not appear to be too selective with its appetites and will be appeased with any variety. Pour as much as your hand can hold and tip it into the bowl. Just to summarize, the needed ingredients are as follows. Salt, oak ashes, Artesmia vulgaris, or its Norwegian variant, menstrual blood, and mead. With these ingredients all within a small bowl, they now have to be mixed together, preferably with the use of a pestle and mortar. Once the mixture has been ground into a peculiar liquid, you will have ended up with a concoction that the Scottish would have referred to as Its translation from Gaelic into English, roughly meaning dirty mixture. The substance now needs to be rubbed onto the skin. It can be applied anywhere on the human body, but it is preferable to avoid rubbing the mixture near the head, neck, and genital regions. While many of the people of Old Scotland didn't have this luxury, today's audiences are recommended to use a set of gloves to apply the mashakakakata as a combination of ingredients could have unfavorable results if they were to enter the bloodstream or be swallowed. This also saves the applicant from the embarrassment of having menstrual blood on their fingers. Gather a small portion of the makakakakakakaka using your fingertips and rub it into the chosen part of your body. The area covered by the mixture should be around the width of a tennis ball. Any larger is not preferable. Do not rub the mixture into a part of the body that has an open wound or is in the process of healing from an injury. Once the mechagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachagachag
has been applied to your skin. This opens up a one-way channel of communication with the Fuil Vulcan. You will not notice any particular change, but the entity will now be aware of your presence and will listen to what you have to say. In order to summon a Vulcan, you will need to recite a verse that will determine the details as to how the entity will interact with you. Originally, a Gaelic verse would have been spoken to rouse it, but this has since been lost over the years. A roughly interpreted English version was made in the 16th century and works to the same effect. Possibly due to the close proximity of English and Gaelic speakers at the time of the Balkans' peak in popularity, this verse needs to be recited in English and spoken properly. Any mistake or deviation means the entity will not appear. This night, I ask your ear in time. A gift from you, shaped as a crime. I offer my body, not cloth or ring. I desire above any other thing. Take what is yours, fulfill your end. Meet me in sleep, I shall not defend. Work your powers like in days long past. I will be neither the first nor the last. You will have noticed in the verse there is a blank space in the fourth line. At that point, the speaker is to state a certain influence that they would like to have bestowed upon them. This trait has to be within the capabilities of a human body. So the powers of flight and immortality are totally out of the question. Such traits that were desired at the time of this ritual were strength, intelligence, fertility and health, among many others. And it is advised that readers are to stick with this line of thinking when stating a desired characteristic. Once you have shouted the incantation, lay down on a bed or any suitable surface and try to go to sleep. You must turn off all the lights and be in total darkness. Otherwise, the Vulcan will not make itself known. Hopefully, you will be fully unconscious when the Vulcan has been brought to your current location. If not, keep totally still and do not make a sound. Alerting the creature will botch the ritual and the summoner could be at the receiving end of some potentially fatal injuries. The Fuil Bokken itself is rather small, but moves with surprising speed. The first thing it will do when it has manifested within the vicinity is to smell the air, trying to sniff out where the m has been applied. Within a few seconds, it will have located the area where it has been rubbed in and will proceed to crawl over your body. Its skin is cold and covered in scales, much like a snake, so be prepared for when it comes into contact. If you are lying beneath a set of covers, it will crawl under and start muttering to itself once it has finally found the area applied with the m Hopefully, you will have placed the mixture in a sensible part of the body for the following reason. After finishing its muttering, the creature will then quickly bite into the area where the mixture has been rubbed in, sucking the blood of its summoner, granting and growling in the process. The bite can be exceedingly painful, and the razor-sharp teeth of the Vulcan will dig deep into the flesh. Again, make no sound, as it is at this point where the summoner is at their most vulnerable. Several unlucky souls are known to have died violently from giving in to their fear at this point. The m acts as an opening for the Fuil Bokken, fermenting the blood in a way that allows it to provide its services to the recipient, albeit in return for a macabre snack. Upon having its fill of blood, the Bokken 
will remove its mouth from the area where the mixture was applied, only to lurch downwards with another painful bite. This time instead of sucking, the entity will secrete a chilling fluid into the body, which will travel through the bloodstream. This is not a pleasant process, and the subject is required to remain silent and unmoving for this final part of the ritual. The full Vulcan should then remove itself from the summoner and crawl away back into the darkness. It will then demanifest, satisfied with a belly full of blood. If the summoner has kept quiet and docile at this point, then the ritual can be considered a success. The following morning, the summoner will find that the trait they requested to be improved in the verse will be amplified to a great extent. Those requiring strength will find that they are able to perform in the manner of a professional athlete, while others who called for good health will find themselves as fit as a mahogany fiddle. These bestowed benefits have allowed the Fuel Bokken to develop a devoted audience over the years, used time and time again for a great many purposes. However, while it appears that summoning the Fuel Bokken holds great potential for those determined to contact it, these sessions come at a very dear price. The effects that the Bokken provide are temporary, usually dissipating within the space of a month. Records show that the Scotia subspecies of Artesmia norvegica would be able to provide the effects to last longer in the body, but this is no longer a viable option for modern audiences. The other detriment is that the vicious bite marks left by the entity will remain on the body permanently. While this has deterred several from attempting to summon the creature again, if at all, a persistent few have gone on to have many further meanings with the Bokken, rubbing them in more areas of the body, hoping to retain the changes they had felt since the first ritual, which in turn means more bite marks that take greater effort to hide. With all this said, it does make one wonder, especially in today's society that demands perfection. How far will a person be willing to go to change themselves for their own benefit? The truth is that those who are summoning the Fuel Bokken are more frequent than you realize and possibly very near and dear to you. Ask yourself, have you noticed any friends or relatives that will go out of their way to cover up certain areas of their body? Whether it's your one friend who insists on wearing trousers in the peak of summer, or your cousin who always wears shoes inside the house. Do you ever question what their deal is? Does it ever make you wonder what it is they have to hide? It could be a bite mark. Maybe something more. Having difficulty staying awake there? Trying to study for some big exam? Finish some last minute assignment that you put off all weekend and it's now free in the morning and you're absolutely exhausted? Or perhaps you were in a similar state recently and are looking for help on what to do. Well friend, I have just a prescription to ease your weary mind. All you have to do is win a game. Setting up the game is relatively simple. All you need is an hourglass, a candle, and a marker. Let me make one thing specifically clear. You need an hour glass, not one of those rinky dinky 30 second pieces of shit you get out of a cereal box or board game. Before playing the game, test your hourglass to make sure that it takes an hour or slightly longer to drain out all of the sand from one section to the other. 
Having it take slightly longer will help, but too long or too short and you'll run into complications during the game. You must also be completely alone in the room while playing. When you are ready to play, choose any room that can be sealed, simply meaning that all doorways and windows can be closed. Any other form of timekeeping device or alarm must be taken out of the room prior, or the game will not begin. The hourglass will be your only time tracking tool, hence why having an accurate hourglass is crucial. Anything with an electronic display should also be removed. This includes TVs, cell phones, computer monitors, anything. Leaving them in the room during the game will put you at a massive disadvantage. You may begin the game at 8 p.m. Make sure the room is sealed, drawing the curtains to block any outside light, then draw a simplistic hourglass shape on the back of one of your hands. Make sure to remember well which hand it was, since you'll mostly be in the dark for this game. Take the candle and light it, then turn off the lights, and sit down on the floor with the three previously mentioned objects close together and flip the hourglass so the sand begins to fall into an empty half. The only source of light should be your candle. Now, yell something along the lines of I'm not tired and I refuse to go to sleep. Close your eyes to the count of ten and open them again. You won't be entirely sure but somewhere in the room you'll think you can see the shadowy outline of a man. You have now begun the game, and your opponent is none other than the master of sleep himself, the Sandman. Do not provoke him, and do not speak to him either. You've challenged him, and in a way insulted him about his profession, so he's not in the best of moods to say the least. Now comes the game. Your task is to stay awake for as long as possible, to a maximum of 8 hours, which will take you to 4 a.m. Every hour, you must flip the hourglass to reset it and keep the game going. Each time you flip the hourglass, you may take the marker and draw a tally mark on your arm. The specifics of which arm you mark will be explained later, and don't think you can just flip the hourglass 8 times really quickly or just draw 8 lines on your arm. The hour needs to pass in order for the magic to work. If you fail to flip the hourglass before the very last grain of sand falls, or should you succumb to sleep, you'll lose. During this time, the Sandman will be deploying as many tricks as possible to get you to fall asleep or give in. See, the bottom half of your hourglass, at any time, represents his power. The more sand, the stronger his influence will be. Almost immediately upon starting, you'll begin to feel drowsy. This is merely his presence. If you cannot last against this, stop playing immediately. During the first hour, he won't do a lot. He may walk around the room, but he won't touch you or speak to you. Even if you try to talk to the being, which is something you should really avoid doing, there will be no response. Also, don't move from your spot to approach him. The closer you get, the more drowsy you will become. And if you're not near your candle, he may put it out so you can go to sleep. Do not distract yourself during this time. You may easily lose track of time and forget to flip the hourglass on time. The Sandman can also skew your perception of how much time has passed, but he cannot affect the hourglass. So keeping your focus on that is your best chance of winning. Side note, 
If you try to leave the room, you will find that the doors are all locked and the windows reveal nothing but an unyielding darkness as far as you can see. After you pass the first hour, the Sandman may scoff, but will continue to stay in the room. Now, he will begin to pull more from his bag of tricks. He's seen that you're going to be a hard one to put down. The sounds of music boxes and harps may be heard, at first from a distance, but will slowly grow to a level that would be audible and comforting. Resist the urge to close your eyes and listen. Your body will grow weary as you approach hour two or three, depending on how the Sandman is feeling that night. Around this point, he will begin speaking to you in many voices. The soft voice of a young girl, the wise cackling laugh of a grandparent, or perhaps even in the ever-loving, recognizable words of your own mother. They will try to congratulate you on surviving for so long with the Sandman, for braving sleepless days and nights to win this game. Whispers of lullabies and nursery rhymes will fill your head, but you know better. Say nothing and ignore the voices. No matter how real they may seem, don't listen to them. Do not go to sleep. If you manage to make it to the halfway point and now have four marks on your arm, you'll be nothing less than exhausted and the Sandman will be nothing less than enraged. He will begin to manipulate your environment even more and start using new tactics to get you to sleep. Instead of trying to lull you to sleep, he will attack you. Hallucinations will occur. You'll see horrifying images of the dead hanging from the ceiling, flashed by a spotlight of unknown origin. The room may start to close in, and then stretch out, and close in again, and stretch back out. A whisper in your ear will turn into shouting in your face from an invisible source. Already weakened and sleep deprived, your remaining energy will be drained in bursts from his terrors. You may have sudden adrenaline rushes, sure, but the Sandman is clever. He'll time them so that you can't just survive to the next hour by simply being anxious. He'll wait until your emotional state has fallen just another level lower, and then two rotted feet dangling in front of your face. You can scream all you want. You can beg for him to stop, but this will only use up more of your ability to function. At the six hour mark, the hallucinations will shift between horror and comfort, while the Sandman will begin to pick your brain and find what nightmares cause you to come to a cold sweat many a night. Others will coax you towards slumber, claiming that you've put up with enough and that you deserve your rest. A warm bed to tuck yourself into, a pillow made from the softest of furs and feathers. The harps and music boxes will start to overload your sense of hearing. In your state, you may welcome the chance to sleep, but snap out of it. Have you been watching the hourglass, making sure his terrors aren't distracting you? This is why you don't talk to the Sandman. For every tiny detail about yourself you give him, he will use against you. This is also the part where electronic displays can become a massive problem. They will turn on regardless of whether they are powered or not, and should you gaze upon their mystifying image for too long, your eyelids will droop and your body will collapse onto the floor. If you had just turned screens away, the Sandman might use some muscle and turn it back towards you, 
so you can get a better view. The curtains may open to a brilliant dawn or a clear blue sky, but the only truths in this room are your arm and the hourglass. Unless you have eight marks, the game is not over. Use any ounce of strength you have to flip that hourglass. Now an immense chore from the same man's influence. Scrawl a line down with your arm on the marker. Even if it looks like you are taking a knife and slashing your own arm open. During the final hour, the Sandman will begin to address you directly, asking you questions that appear to be simple. But as you are, you can't even remember what 2 plus 2 equals. A question is the hardest thing to get out of your head, so don't let it get in. Cover your ears and just watch the hour class. Keep those eyes open. Don't fall asleep. If the question gets in your head, you'll start to think about it, adding more stress and draining you of what little mental will you have left. It might become hard to breathe, as if something is squeezing your lungs, or the air is dense and hard to take. The Sandman will also get physical, grabbing you and throwing you across the room, leaving you to crawl back to the hourglass before time is up. If you catch a glimpse of his face, it may be enough of a nightmare to haunt you and keep your eyes from shutting. There will be no distinguishable facial features, save two bloody eyes, the lids torn from the sockets, endlessly staring. Anyone who has made it to the seventh hour mark has never had the strength to successfully break it, and either carried on or surrendered to their dreams. You will not receive a reward for ending the game this way, save the mercy of avoiding the Sandman's wrath. If you do make it to the end of the eighth hour without falling asleep, you will not need to flip the hourglass again. Simply make the eighth mark on your arm and close your eyes. However you ended the game, you cannot sleep just yet. There's one final task remaining. All you must do is wait for the Sandman to collect the hourglass and say, You're all grown up now. Sleep when you wish. Open your eyes and find that the hourglass is gone and the candle put out. Now you may collapse in slumber, a 12 hour slumber to be precise. The game puts a heavy strain on your mind and body, so recovery is necessary. But it's the last sleep you'll ever need, or at least to that length, because once you've fully recovered, you will be able to stay awake for an extra hour for each tally on your marked arm. Depending on your normal sleep schedule, this may mean that you only need a small nap, maybe an hour or two at most, but for some, you'll never have to lie down again. Sure, you will have the ability to do so if you want to. You can still even dream, but there will never be any weariness following you. Just think of how productive you can be. But it's not all unicorns and rainbows. If you mark any tallies on your arm that were not marked by the hourglass, you will instead require more sleep. One hour for each tally on the blank arm to be precise. You will require more rest to be able to even function throughout your day. Now these marks can cancel with the ones on your marked arm, but if that's not the case, you may have just gone through all of that suffering, only to come out worse than before. And what with your delirious state throughout the game, it's unlikely for the average individual to come out with all the towies on the marked arm. There are also circumstances of losing. If you fail to flip the hourglass, then the Sandman will gain full power, 
and with a snap of his fingers, you will collapse to the ground. Regardless of how you fall asleep, be it by failure of the hourglass or succumbing to your own tiredness, you will also sleep for 12 hours to recover, but it will be the worst sleep you'll ever have and the salmon will make damn sure that's the case. The worst nightmares will flood your mind, leaving you unable to escape or wake up in a relief-filled cold sweat. All you can do is endure the torture of a dream that feels like years. And when you finally come to consciousness the next morning, there you will be, lying on the floor of the room, the mark still on your arm, and blood flowing from where your eyelids once rested. You said you refused to close your eyes and go to sleep. The Sandman has simply granted that wish. Think of your favorite Hollywood actress, past or present. Almost anyone will do. No matter who you think of, chances are she has a secret. No, I'm not talking about her skincare regime, or her hairstylist, or whatever crazy diet she might be on. I mean, sure, lots of glamorous Hollywood types do these things, but many, more than you would think, don't need to go through the trouble. They literally wake up like that, more or less. And it's all because they got a little help from Red Helen. Who's Red Helen? You might be thinking she's some beauty guru to the stars, or a plastic surgeon or something, but you'd be wrong. No one knows exactly who, or perhaps what, Red Helen is. Some say she's the infamous Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in history, the face that launched a thousand ships. Others say that her name is a bastardization, or possibly a combination of the words, helpful one. Still, others of a more religious bent say the name refers to the great inferno below, hinting at possible demonic origins. Whatever Red Helen is, once you've let her into your life, her effects are undeniable. Summoning Helen is almost deceptively simple. All you really need are a handful of items that can be found nearly anywhere. These include a red taper candle, some fresh rose petals, a standing or vanity mirror, and a knife. Simple steak knives have been known to work, although Helen tends to favor people whose choices show a little bit more class and discernment. A ritual dagger, such as you might find in an occult supply store, would be best, but there's really no need to break the bank. Sincerity is more likely to win Helen over than any one item used to summon her. Once you have everything you need, you are ready to make contact with Helen. Wait for a Friday night. One during a full moon might be best. The light the moon provides will be useful. Choose a quiet room in a quiet house where you can be sure you will not be disturbed. Interrupting the ritual at any time before its completion will result in failure. At approximately 11.30 p.m., Turn off all lights in your chosen room and disconnect any electronic devices. Simply covering them up will not be enough. Everything must be totally unplugged. Take no more than 30 minutes to accomplish this task, as the ritual must begin no later than midnight. Once your electronics are unplugged, you are ready to begin. Sit opposite the mirror with the candle before you. Clear your mind and steady your breathing. When the silence in the room becomes something you can feel on your skin, like an oppressive dark blanket, take a handful of rose petals and sprinkle them clockwise around the candle. As you do this, recite the following rhyme. 
Helen's looks are lovely. Helen's looks can kill. No one has escaped her. No one ever will. This rhyme, combined with the action, invites Helen to join you. If she has accepted your invitation, you'll soon feel a strange warmth on your face, as if someone has just held their hands over a fire and then touched your cheeks. If you feel this, continue with the ritual. If, however, you don't feel the warmth after three minutes, then without hesitation, you must stand up, leaving everything as it is, walk out of the building, and sleep somewhere else for the night. Do not return to the site where you attempted the ritual until 8 o'clock the following morning at the absolute earliest. The reason for this is simple. Sprinkling the petals and speaking the rhyme causes something to join you no matter what. If you don't feel the warmth on your face, then what has come to join you is not Helen. Theories range as to who or what it is, but all agree. It's not something you want to be alone with in a dark room in the middle of the night. However, if you do feel the warmth, then you must proceed to the next step. There is no turning back now. Light the candle and let your gaze linger on the flame for a moment. When the moment feels right, look up from the flame and gaze into the mirror. Whatever you see, do not flinch or make a sound. Before you will be your own reflection, but every imperfection you have will be magnified to utter grotesqueness. Everything you hate about yourself will become prominent. You may want to scream or cry or avert your eyes, but do none of these things. Simply look and accept your own ugliness. Failure to do so will plunge the room into darkness, and then there will be no help for you. You must slowly gaze at your hideous reflection for what will feel like hours, and then something remarkable will happen. Slowly, all of your features will soften, gradually forming themselves into the most beautiful version of you that you've ever seen. Not even your most vivid fantasies will be able to match the beauty you see before you. This, it's believed, is Helen's way of showing you how the world will see you if you welcome her into your life. In that moment, you will feel all the joy and satisfaction that an appearance like the one you see can give you. You will almost lose yourself in euphoria when suddenly the face will become grotesque again. When this happens, it is your cue to perform the next step. Pick up the knife and, without hesitating, drag the blade across your cheek. The cheek you select doesn't seem to matter, but the skin must be broken and blood must be drawn. This act shows Helen two things. The first is you are willing to part with whatever makes you ugly. The second is that you are willing to suffer, to receive and maintain her gifts. As for your reflection, you will now have an accurate view of yourself as you are at this moment, bleeding, gash and all. Once this is the case, the ritual has ended. Pinch out the candle with your fingers but otherwise leave everything as it is and promptly go to bed. Do not tend to your wound as you normally would, but leave it open and bleeding. Only after the clock strikes eight in the morning can you clean up your ritual space and receive medical treatment if necessary. The story you tell the doctors to account for your wound is entirely up to you. But do not give away the secret of Red Helen. If someone is meant to find out about Helen, it will not be because you told them. Helen will arrange some other means of letting them know. Whether or not Helen has accepted you will become apparent soon enough. 
If your ritual has failed, your wound will become infected. At best, a hideous scar will form, and you'll be disfigured for as long as you live. At worst, the infection will spread into your bloodstream, and you will die. However, if you have been successful, then you will find that your wounds heal very quickly. More quickly than it should. Should you find yourself successful, the benefits of Helen's influence on your life will be immediate and unmistakable. People of all kinds will clamor to be near you. New doors and opportunities will open up in places you never fought to look before. If you happen to be an actor or a model, you will never be without work, and legions of your fans will worship you on all on account of your remarkable beauty. There is, of course, a catch. In return for all that she has given you, Red Helen must occasionally be paid. As a beneficiary of Helen's, falling in love with somebody marks that person for collection. It may be immediate, or it may take years. Occasionally, Helen will even allow you to marry and form a whole life of that person before wrenching them away from you. But the result is always the same. One day, there will be a freak accident, or a surprise heart attack, or something similar. It's unavoidable. And some may argue that it's only fair. And what happens if you steer clear of love? Well, that might work for a time, but it won't get you very far. As far as anyone can tell, Helen does not like feeling cheated. She won't kill you though, but when you wake up in the hospital and the doctors tell you that no amount of reconstructive surgery will help you, you'll wish she had.